welcome to the Mets Podcast, episode 143. The sun is shining, there's a Dota anime going on, things are looking up. Marco, welcome to the pod, how are you? Very good. Loving some major action. Immense nice. fun. Yeah, it's, especially in COVID times, feels like every time there's a major tournament with international teams, it's like, oh, so exciting. Yeah. So, it's pretty good stuff. And you you enjoying the weather? How's it How's it up Four. there? Finally uh, got some sun? Yeah, I know we waited all month for it and now it's here. It's been, well, it's kind of gone again. But yeah, the over the weekend, Bank Holiday weekend was banging. Sun was shining. Yeah. Good times were had. Yeah, I've somehow managed to contract a common cold as soon as it's got hot. So apologies to the listeners for that. Um, hopefully I won't be too nasally throughout the course of the pod, but we'll have to see. Adam, how are you doing? How's the weather out there? Good. It's rainy. Very rainy. Nice. I don't mind we're, it. we're hogging the sun. I uh, I think I finally have broken my allergies, so that's good. It took about a month. But the season Broke? has changed. Well, it's just like, they're not around anymore. Uh, nice. I just need like a month to deal with all the pollen. <laughs> and then my body's like, okay, we're used to it again. So that's nice. Nice. Plenty to talk about in today's episode. Goss Stat Corner, as always. Going to be talking about some of the animator wildcard meta, some of the hero stuff we've we've been seeing. I don't think any of us have played too many games this week, so we'll, we'll talk about some games, but um, I don't know. We'll see how, how far we get with those. Um, anything we want to shout? To begin with, anything we want to say? I, I have a sort of story that I want to get off my chest. Sounds like a good start. All right, it's not to do a Dota, so I'll, I'll blast through because I know the listeners are falling asleep already. But um, I've been looking for a room to rent for so long, for well, for quite a while. Um, originally in the summer, and then I, I started again looking. Been looking for about a month, maybe three weeks, quite a lot, and. I've basically been like piled off by loads of people, organized a viewing that got cancelled on the day, loads of people saying, oh, we're actually going to give it to someone else or like all this stuff. And it's just been like an absolute nightmare trying to find a room. And then today I was going to view a room that was really nice. And it was in the exact location that I sort of was looking at, I was looking for. And everything was going great. And it was with like an agency. It wasn't with a landlord, which is good because the agencies don't care who you are. They'll just give it the room to you. Um, if you can, if you just say yeah and you stump up the money, they don't care. Whereas a lot of landlords and people that, you know, they're picky about who they choose. So sometimes you can kind of get wrecked by that if they don't like you or something. <laughs> can't, can't have a Dota podcaster in our, in I know, our flat yeah. get out. I know. They asked me what my MMR was and then they're like, <laughs> you having a laugh? What? Um, anyway. So I had a view- viewing scheduled for 1 p.m. today and then I'm like walking you know, I have to take some time off work, nothing major, but, you know, like some take some extra long lunch or something. Walk all the way there. It's two minutes to one. I'm walking down the street that the house is on. <laughs> like, I can see it in the distance. Get a call from the agent and they're like, oh, yeah. And long story short, they're, they're like, oh, sorry, it's not available anymore because the tenant's renewing their contract or something. I don't know, whatever. But I get, not only that, but I get baited so hard because the guy's like... Um, oh, you uh, you're almost there, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, just walking down the street now, and I'm expecting this to be like, oh, cool, I'm like waiting there, or like, oh, I'll be there in a minute. And he's like, oh, okay, awesome. Are you looking to rent? Just to check, are you looking to rent? Because there's two rooms in this property. Are you looking to rent this room for this price or whatever? And I was like, yeah, that's the one. And he was like, oh, are you interested in the other room for any chance? By any chance? And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm only interested in this one room. I don't care about the other one because the other one's not is like a single room, which I don't want. It's very small. So I'm like, no, not interested in that. And he's like, oh, okay. Um, you'd be interested in looking at any other properties like while we're out? And I was like, no, still, I just don't suspect anything. <laughs> then he hits me with the, the room not available after I've like pinned up my hopes and dreams on this room. I was, I was so sad. I actually got, I actually got mega tilted on the phone call as well. So that wasn't great, but that was the saddest, most tilting. That is real ever. life till two minutes to the appointment. You've and I've just walked the way there. like half an hour, yes. Absolute Ooh. joke. 
absolute joke. And I, I was so angry, honestly. It was rough. Um, but then you didn't, you just, like, internally seethed, right? Because you're British. Uh, yeah, for the most part, yeah. I didn't, like, I didn't pop off, but the guy, once he told me, the, the, he was like, oh, do you want to, do you want me to send you through any other, you know, properties, or do you, what else are you interested in? Because I've got some properties here I could tell you about. And I was like, and I just said, um, no, I don't want to hear about it now, and maybe I'll, I'll maybe I'll talk to you in like a few days, but I'm not thinking about anything now because I've just been told that the room's unavailable two minutes <laughs> before I'm going had. in. Yeah, and the guy was like, oh, yeah, really, really sorry about that. And it's like, well, could he not have told me before? I don't know. And then you have to take the long walk back. I know, yeah. Yeah, that was sad times. There you go. So that's that's my story. That's my story of sadness and suffering for today. (laughs) It's not too bad, so. (laughs) I have one along the same lines. I, uh... You know, I went to like three or four different locations to try and get a passport photo taken, you know, just to <laughs> renew it and make sure I have it just in case, uh, you know, we can go to TI. Cool. Yes. And, uh, I go and I finally get it taken. It's like go to the, like the fourth CVS or Walgreens, like a drugstore to get it taken. Mm. And they just make you have like the most dead. <laughs> just look on your face you're like no smiling no glasses take off your coat I showed my mom and dad and they both were like you look like a criminal and they weren't even in the same <laughs> yeah. room they're just like yeah. you look like a criminal I send it to you guys I'm just like this is what I look like when Stan picks Tinker just yeah. dead just <laughs> dead yeah. in the eyes passport photos are so funny everyone looks like every, it looks like everyone's mugshot it actually just looks mm. like your mugshot um, I, I, I definitely look like I'm on day release in mine. That's for sure. Um, maybe we could give the the Adam picture as like a Patreon exclusive. Maybe launch <laughs> launch Patreon next week. It can Top be tier. You get to see our passport photos. A new emote. <laughs> yeah, new emote. It is on about the, the right size. That would be a good amount actually. Dead inside. Hmm. That's a good emote. Well, maybe we'll have they, to make it happen. We need to update like... them. Actually, they're quite old. Hmm. We do the, they do like a biometric, uh, like they analyze the photo to make sure it will pass the government standard or whatever. So there's all these check boxes. And, uh, it does say that I have correct head size. So I got that going for me. <laughs> My good. head's not, it's not too big or not too small. Don't want to have incorrect nice. head size. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we find some games then? Uh, Marco, I'll give you the floor because I, I can only remember one game that I played this week, and that's the one I just played. So I don't feel like I have a whole lot to offer. But what's been going down? Yeah, I don't have that many apart from a handful of ranked losses. My ranked have actually been downwards trend these last couple of weeks, and it did start off with a lot of these games were eighty, ninety percent win rate, and then we lose. But then a few days ago. Is one of these where I've not played for like four or five days and then I jump into ranked and probably a bad shout, a bit rusty and like lose three on the bounce. Um, I can't really remember them. There was a Ricky win, a Ricky loss, sorry, which was extra sad because my stats come up in the pre game. It's like, what is mega stats because I'm always just yeah. abusing party games. I'm like, feeling it. Yeah. 10 minutes in, I'm out 8 0 on Ricky or 7 0, flying. Although it, it, it's one of these again, like when you're ahead and the team drops off MMR, I have all these kills and I'm, I'm literally like 7-0 at 10 minutes. But it's almost as if people think we're further ahead than we are. When you actually look at the graphs, my gold, I've not really been hitting CS that much. I've got a lot of kills, but my gold's like 4.6k at 10 minutes, 11 minutes, like nothing is astounding. And then the other lanes, we're losing mid and we're losing bottom. So it sounds really good to the rest of the team. But I kind of know in my head that this game's not won. It's it's not easy. We've got a mid tinker who I know is going to be AFK. So I'm like, well, I need to be active. So try and be active because they've also got a mag who was farming heavy in the mid. Mag, Mag's flash farming is just sad. It's so sad how fast it is. Um, it's really annoying. Um so I know the farm game's tough. The winning, the enemies pos one's winning as well. So I'm like, I need to be active. 
make space, get kills, Tinker's going to farm. And basically, I try and do that, but I think my pos 3 and pos 4 spell casting, it's a clock and a pit lord. The spell casting and just hero body positioning as a pit was just catastrophic. The cog and the hooks, they just really bad spell casting and then I kind of leak few deaths and they've got this slark that's farming, getting a kill, smags out farming and yeah, we lose a Ricky game and so Ricky loss is always sad but yeah, quite a lot yeah. of rank losses honestly, just I got a Medusa win so I can rely on Medusa these days, I can't win with Luna anymore, I, I feel like I win the early game mid game and then there's that just games are not winnable for some reason, every time I get to a Luna game it, I just I was on a lost streak somehow, and I felt really good on the hero like a couple of weeks ago, stomping mm. the games. But I don't know. It's recently, the f- I actually just don't understand how these games aren't being won, and it's not like we're getting stomped zero, zero minutes in. It's like we're winning or we're ahead, and it, it. I just don't understand it. Is it? I don't understand it. Someone's gonna have to do like a dissertation on it because I, I honestly <laughs> can't get my head around it. So ranked games are pretty, pretty naff. Ra- Pos- Pos- do so just AFK kill creeps like Luna style is there much different uh, or? I think maybe because the lo- uh, maybe it's easy to close out a game on do so because you just go late and late and late but with Luna uh, one of the issues in one of the games was like the the Roshan and not getting ages it feels like the ages is really necessary um I don't know honestly the Luna games it doesn't it didn't really feel like my hero. It, uh, I actually just can't remember the bullshit. It's just I don't know. Yeah, it's just one of these where your team. I don't know. Oh, I can't even the team. Maybe if like, you, yeah, if you games picked Deuce in the Luna or... games and Luna in the Deuce games, maybe it would have been the same result because it's more about the play. Maybe. Um, I might have come back to you on my uh, Luna analysis about why it's not been winning. I mean, one of them we've got this Tinker who's like popping off, but it. I don't, genuinely, it's these factors which are not Dota related. So then one of them is the Tinker is popping off, but he's popping off too much. He's all chatting. He's literally <laughs> all chatting. I don't care about this game. It's so easy, like, screw all you. And we're all, and then he kind of dies to the enemy invoker, and then the enemy invoker's like, all chatting him, tilting him back, and, and Tinker's like, this game's a joke, like, so he, like, I don't care. And just, awful attitude. And it feels like in every Luna game I play, I've just got the worst attitude team ever that either A, we're so far ahead, we drop off, fall asleep, and they come back. Or B, we've got these, like, kind of obnoxious egos, like this Tinker, literally all typing, like, oh, I can't, I don't care about this game, even though we're winning and we're crushing. It always feels like a team synergy reason when I'm playing Luna, and we can't, and we, like, try and finish the game, or we don't finish it because of, like, communication or just synergy or just mental attitude like all these non-dota aspects feels like i've been losing the game like the fucking base race lost with luna every time it's like these bizarre reasons to lose like just stupid non-dota reasons honestly it's weird really weird man (laughs) um adam games you haven't had many but you you played four games nice i'm three and one and, we had some parties, but, they were fun. Yeah, but that one loss made me question why I play the game. It oh, I had one like that. What the was most yours? soul-crushing <laughs> loss. Uh, yeah, it was the only game I haven't pl- didn't play with um, you or Stan. And I was a five Oracle, and we load into the game, and my teammate's like, oh, great, they've got this guy on the other team. He's like a ranked 80 and we have a terrible draft, and it's rank 80 Quap versus Ancient Zeus mid, and the Quap just destroys the Zeus, and we lose all three lanes, and it's like, okay, well, at least it'll be quick. They take all the tier twos, and then the Necro is like, on the other team, is like, let me finish my quest for three-man death pulses. And we're just like, no. <laughs> it's like no I hate doing that I hate it like people giving people their quests it's like if you want to get your quest maybe you shouldn't have won so hard you don't get to have both um, yeah it's not yeah, who cares about giving people quests yeah and well they're just like alright your your funeral you know we won't finish the game and then 25 minutes they just they do not push they just farm everywhere 
anyone tries to go out of the base to, uh, like, push out a wave, they kill them, and they go back to farming. Take Aegis, don't push, go back to farming. And they just hold the game hostage. It's not like they fountain farm, they just don't, uh, don't do anything. And, uh, the Necro, I guess he has so much time, because the game is so boring at this point, that, uh, he starts to flame me and my win rate for the last month. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm so, he's like, yeah, you only have a 40% win rate in the last month. And I'm like, all right. I didn't know that. I, I could, you know, that's probably true. Because <laughs> so I haven't weird. played very much, but also, like, uh, you know, I've been losing a lot. None of it ranked, but it, not, not that it even matters. It's just, like, such a weird thing. And I couldn't figure out, it's like, why? Like, I don't, I go on Dota Buff, like, I don't even know how to find <laughs> win rate in the last month without, like, heavily clicking and filtering things. And I'm like, man, that's a really, uh, it's a really deep dig. And he's like, dude, just download Overwolf. That, I fucking hate that app. And then I go to Dota Buff and I look, and there are eight people in this game that are anonymous. Eight out of ten. It is such a pandemic. Like, it's so ridiculous that people are hiding their match history for unranked games. And that this app tells you who to ban at the beginning of the game. And then, like, it gives you their win rate over the last month. So you have flame things to say. Like, it's just so ridiculous Mm -hmm. uh, that, like, it spits out all this info. Um I know, and then it was funny because I think that same day, early in the day, there was a big Reddit thread about, like, why yeah. is this, you know, like, why won't Valve limit it? And, uh, like, I don't, um, I had it at one time. I had it for, like, maybe a month, and I just got rid of it because it was, like, it's too much of a hassle to tab over and be, like, it was just, I didn't feel like it was always accurate. It was, like, labeling people Smurfs and... Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't, and I didn't like the mental effect it was having on me, to where it was like, oh, this game's over, they got two Smurfs, and we don't have, you know, two Smurfs, and blah, 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 so it was like, I'll just get rid of it, but it's like so silly that we face off against a five stack, they're all hidden, it's like they all just stack with a high rank player, and just hold the game hostage, and take the time to, like, flame you, for this, for like six hundred uh, Dota plus points on their hero, like it's it's stupid. And then what ended up my teammate just ended up abandoning, like my uh, my party member. He's just like, I'm not a. Let's just leave. Yeah. And so he tanked the abandon, and then because you abandon, you're not allowed to report. Like you can't report after the game. So they get to keep doing it. Fun times. Uh, yeah, it was just like. He's like, uh, yeah, you have a 40% winner. He's like, yeah, I don't stack with rank 80s. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Overwatch is such a... It's such a huge advantage. It's really quite silly. You know, when you're playing ranked and... Basically, if you're someone that likes to play the same heroes very often and you're going to be identified as a spammer on Overwolf, Overwatch or whatever, if you don't hide your match data you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage because your hero's going to get banned like every game. Yeah, I mean, that's why I... When I play ranked, I know that's for a fact why, like, Gyrocopter gets banned. Because, like, yeah. why else would anyone ban a Gyro? It's yeah, it's 100%. all... It's like, you know, either Spirit Breaker or Gyro gets banned. And it's like, this is not that popular of a thing. And I know it happens too often for it to be a random thing. I mean, I was just talking about it last week with the Darkseer. You know, I tried to pick the Darkseer to get it banned because I knew the enemies had, like, a Darkseer-only player because I use Overwatch because I don't want to, like... I don't want to give up on, you know, having an advantage. But I totally agree. It's stupid. It is very stupid because... It's like only people that should be hiding their match data are pros, you know? Yeah. It It's like... Just so silly that we're at a state where you load into a random pub game at like twelve o'clock at night, and everyone is hiding their data. Yeah, I think m- most of the like a lot of the fun I get out of the game is like all the stats and the data and stuff. So 
it's just so silly that you can't like look at any of it because everyone's hiding. Yeah. Yeah, that's annoying. Um for my games, I've actually played one game. I played one game of Dota this week, and that was the game I just played with Adam, which was quite a a funny game for a number of reasons. First of all, you know you know when you haven't played Dota for ages, but you've been watching Pro Dota and then you load into a game thinking it's gonna be like yeah. some tier one level Dota like sick oh. plays and movement. And, and then, then it's all just of a like sudden this. you're down nine nothing in the laning stage. <laughs> yeah, and you so for me I'm playing Centaur Pos three, expecting some like sick laning, like top tier Dota, like some great stuff. And then I'm greeted with a a tech like techies pos four that's jungling, so I'm just solo lane, like getting stomped, and it's just like, oh, this is not what I signed up for. This is not the beautiful game that I've been watching on Twitch for the last like two days. So that was a rude awakening back to pub level Dota. Also, this game was really weird because it's it's one of those games that feels like you shouldn't win, but we actually we we win reasonably comfortably in this game, despite. Me, five Omni Knight. Well, yeah, five Omni Knight from Adam. Exceptional. Um, but basically, we've got a techies that's AFK farming. Uh, pop, you know, quote unquote pos four, but actually pos one. And then we've got a jug that's the actual pos one, the safe lane core that's playing a really AFK style, you know, really like head down farming. Which is fine because obviously you can win games like that, and we do win, get, we do win this game. But it's, I'm sitting there on Centaur with like Vanguard Hood in the bot lane trying to take a tier one with like a Hoodwink or a Abba just ready to be killed if we just rotate there. And it's just not happening. So I'm like, oh God, this, this game's so rough. And then they go on me, you know, with three heroes and with Retaliate and Stampede and stuff. I'm getting, I'm like just dying with them get on like a third HP. And I'm like, oh, nothing. This game's so rough. We're just not doing anything. There's no movement. We're not playing any areas of the map. We're just like heads down AFK. So it feels like we just shouldn't win. And then we come good with the techies. The classic techies just blows up some heroes with mines. And then Jug just emerges having, you know, not participated in a single kill and sort of losing his lane quite hot, you know, losing the tower at least. Yeah. The only reason the Jug goes in the AFK mode is because we died eight times between us in the laning stage. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's funny looking at this now on Dota buff. Uh, it's, that defines the laning stage as 0 to 12. We are down 12 kills the 4 with 8 of them being in the top lane and yet we're 2k gold ahead and 1k XP ahead. Yeah. I mean, Cent- Centaur's a hell of a hero. I would say that. Because in this game, I don't deal any damage, and I've still got 28k hero damage. And I feel like I, that's more than the techies. And, this is, you know, there's a techies that's using a lot of mines. I've got a lot of kills in this game. I have 10 deaths in this game. I'm 4 and 10 in this game. But, yeah, I've got 28k hero damage. That's 2k less than the jug. The jug's got 30k. That's just from retaliate, basically, I feel like. I'd love to see a breakdown of what that's from. Because it, it must just be retaliate and double edge. Yeah, it's it's interesting, but and obviously, and I've got eighty k or seventy eight k damage received, which is the most on the team by about ten k, which is as you'd expect. Um, so Centaur yeah. is Centaur's a good hero. I do think on Centaur Heart is an underrated item. Every time I build Heart on any hero, I always feel really good about it. It's rare that I feel bad about building a heart. I know it's five k. Well, you, but... you, you mean you don't? You feel safe when you have like eight hundred more HP and like eighty <laughs> yeah. health and shit. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah exactly that. But when you're playing heroes like CK or um, PL, I guess is a bit of a classic. But Centaur or any strength hero, maybe not Underlord. I never build it on Underlord. Never even tried it, but. I think Heart slept on a little bit in Pub Dota, at least, because just being really tanky is OP in pubs. Being tanky and and high damage are two of OP things in Pub Dota. I think more OP than heroes that are really good at positioning or really active, at least in like trench tier Dota. I think just being really tanky and doing a lot of damage is the most important thing. Yeah, it's like um, heals are the same. Like heals are OP because they make you 
live longer and deal more damage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, hard as a heal. That game, I, I randomed a Omni Knight, and I played it five. And it was fun after the laning stage. Because all you do is sit behind a hero and heavenly grace them. And if you have a jug spin, and then you heavenly grace after that, it's like, he just can't be stopped. Mm. And it was funny, Kanka and I were having a fight, and it was like, CM was channeling her ult and got off all her spells, and we got invokered, and like, oh, yeah. you know, tree spells, and then he looks at me, and I'm level 10, and I haven't skilled a he- uh, Guardian Angel yet, and he's just like, why haven't you skilled this, like... At level 10, you're trash. And it's like, we all, we just took like 2,000 magic damage. Like, yeah, literally no right clicks. Yeah. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, this doesn't do anything. Yeah, it made me laugh. Um, I actually have a thought about th- this game has been, uh, look, I have a thought um, from this game that's, I think, very applicable in general. And that's, I think, Dota players especially obviously in lower and Mars, like myself included, are so results biased. We talked about this before, how you expect a team fight to go exactly the same as the last team fight went, because you're so you're so like confirmation biased and you're so results orientated. And I think the same goes for things like laning and which heroes are stronger in just a one V one hit fest. The example that this game made me think of is I'm I'm laning against an Abaddon and I'm a centaur. Um, and in the laning stage, he's sort of got my number because I'm solo and Techies is like off farming creeps um, across the map. And so I'm being run at by like a CM Abba and I can't stand up to that. But once I get my Vanguard and I've got level 3 Retaliate, it actually flips on its head and, and now I'm able to man up against the Abaddon, especially because the CM's off stacking and stuff and not, not in the lane full time. Um, but because when I get my Vanguard, I'm Norton 2, Abba's 2-0, a bit ahead of me on gold. He's got an Orb of Corrosion and obviously it's very easy to just look above your head and see this counter getting to 4 and then suddenly Abba hitting you really hard and you're super, super slowed. And you're just thinking, oh crap, I'm so slowed. I need to run. I'm get. I need to get out of this. But actually, you you really don't. And the best play is to just man up. And something like retaliate in Vanguard because it's invisible. It's so underrated. We've talked about it before, or at least I've talked about it before, with something like Atrophy Aura on Underlord and how I think it's like insane. But it's really easy to overlook these things and not understand how powerful you have become, like your your power spike sort of thing. And just treat the game like the next minute is going to go the same as the minute before. Um, so I, I died in this game once, trying to run away from an ABBA, where I realised too late that actually I could just man up against him and he probably would have died. Um, so that made me think that. I have a, uh, I have one um, pro tip. Yeah. If you're against a tree and protector hoodwink lane, and you have a Quelling Blade as a Juggernaut, you should cut trees. <laughs> because I yep. was the 5 Omni Knight, I even bought a Quelling Blade, but you can only cut so many trees. <laughs> but if you both have Quelling Blades, they shouldn't get a lane. Like, trees should be completely useless if you kill all the trees. That's high yeah. level, that. That's so and, smart. Well, it's just like, you just sit there and look at this passive quelling blade like man i swear like six of these deaths are preventable <laughs> in this lane <laughs> stage yeah quelling blade doesn't have an active before like six km i don't think <laughs> and it is so satisfying to cut the bushwhack tree or the whatever the cue at the acorn yeah, yeah. you kill that tree and it's just like yeah. oh your w doesn't do it like it's so nice so you're that's the next level play Go on, go on. To your point, Stan, I've got a reverse example of that where I was playing Ursa against the Mars in ranked, and I'm rusty and I didn't appreciate hero matchups and just got outskilled. But in my head, I guess, I was thinking, like, Ursa, you just maul any melee hero. Yeah. But at level one or level two, 
Ursa's base stack is like 45, and your swipes, Fury swipes are like 10, nothing. Level 1 Mars with HP armor, Bulwark, oh, is it Bulwark? The, uh... Contribute. W? No, the, yeah, the defensive one, Bulwark, right? The, the, the e. passive. The passive, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Mars have got that, which is like 50% damage reduction from the front or something. So in my head, I'm thinking, oh yeah, when you're Ursa, you're more than these melee heroes. But then I try and do that at, say, this level 1, level 2. These right clicks doing literally no damage to the Mars. You need about <laughs> yeah. 20 Fury Swipes to do any damage. And then because he's a Mars, if you're in melee range, his spells are just unmissable. Slaps you with a W, throws you into a into a tree. And I was like, oh shit, like, Ursa's actually useless. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it kind of took me a couple of deaths to realize this. Um, but the I guess thing another, is, yeah, yeah. Right. but I was particularly, say go on, go on, go on. Particularly the Mars tankiness. Like there are some lanes where I have played it, where it's a melee off laner, and the Ursa you can you get the right clicks, and over time they will lose to you, so they have to retreat, and so you win that aggression. But with this Mars case, it was like that guy's not backing down because he's got tankiness and bulwark and his right clicks are doing shit all. And then his spells are like popping my damage like way harder than my right clicks are slowly doing. So right. yeah, I have a reverse of your scenario thinking I was strong, but I'm not strong until I'm like level five with an item, say. Yeah, but that's that's the point, isn't it? That when you do get level five with an item, you are strong. And then you I think, it on, yeah. Yeah, but I think a lot of people wouldn't appreciate that and they'd get level five get their item and still think that because they lost the last trade with mars they're going to lose the next one not yeah. appreciating like the change in the scenario they've almost got to see it to believe it if you know what i mean yeah um but i guess that's sort of like a game feel thing it is yeah um, and all it, it's, it, it, it's, it's it's something that i feel like i'm really like bad at if you know what i mean I, yeah the game feel is massive and that intuition and I, like i said i've not really been playing much and it was literally in the course of this laning stage i was like my MMR was going up like hundreds every minute because I was like, oh, wait, okay, I'm not meant to do this because I, I can't trade with his W. But, oh, he's used his W, and now I can abuse that, and I, I can get favorable trade for 10 seconds. And I was literally, like, learning how to lane again. Over And obviously it went bad because this guy's like a veteran Mars player playing rank 10 games a day or whatever, just slapping me. Yeah. And I was just not ready for it, but it was, I genuinely was just getting so much feel over the course of the lane phase. So yeah, that intuition and playing games and getting a feel for like limits and strengths, etc., and peaks is, is obviously so big and important, particularly the higher up you go. So it is interesting. Bulwark is so weird. Like, it's underrated the amount of damage reduction it does. Yeah. Not even just Ursa, like lots of melee heroes, you're like, yeah. I'm gonna go on this guy. You're like, oh, okay. It's like life stealer. You think, oh, great against strength heroes, and then you're a life stealer. And I've been in this situation. Yeah, and you right click the margin. You're like, wait a sec. This guy's like, his HP is not going down. And then he hits you with his spear, and you're like getting slapped. And then you're like, oh shit, he's winning this right click war somehow. And but then, like San says, there comes a point where you probably can start winning that trade, but it's probably not level one. And yeah, it's, it, Bulwark is a weird one. Let's do a little stat corner. I've got a little mini stat corner about evasion. And there's actually not many forms of evasion in the game, uh, but there is a few. First of all, I want to talk about the uphill miss because I, I'm hoping you can clear some stuff up for me because I'm a bit confused about uphill miss mm -hmm. uh, and it, about invasion and missing in general. First of all, do you know what the uphill miss chance is? 25%. 25, 25%, yeah. It is indeed... Here's what I'm a little bit confused about here. So first of all, I think we can agree... I think this is out of date. So the the wiki says um, that a unit is... Cons uh, blah, blah, blah. Basically, a, mi a uphill miss procs if the attacker is at a lower terrain level as the target. A unit is considered to be at a high elevated terrain when it's no longer visible to the player due to the terrain. And this means when an enemy stands on a ramp but is still visible to the player, there is no uphill miss chance. That's not right. Because I've tested it. That's not right. But I'm confused. Did that used to be the case? Uh, that just doesn't seem like it's ever been the case. Yeah, then, that doesn't... Yeah, but that here's seems what's, irrelevant. 
Yeah, here's what's confusing me though. And so it says, as soon as it says, as soon as they disappear in the fog by moving the ramp further up, uphill mischance applied. It does not matter how many terrain levels differences between them. The miss is always 25 percent. Oh. So I don't know if that's just saying if they're on the ramp but not all the way up yeah. the ramp or something. That sounds like it could be like that on the ramp, not at the top of the ramp. Yeah. Here's what's confusing though. So they have a picture of a unit. A ranged unit, in this case it's a Necro 3 unit, rip, attacking up a ramp onto a ranged creep. And on one picture, it comes up with the miss, you know, the red miss. There's like a red cross that says miss. And then it, but it can also have a white cross and it can say evade. So when you're missing uphill, presumably you're getting the miss and you'd never get the evade, right? Because the unit's not evading because they're on the high ground, you're missing because you're on the low ground? Yeah. Then I don't understand where this bottom pitch has come from, where the creep has evaded the attack. I don't understand that. The attack it, it, it's captioned miss appearing on appearing upon missing an attack, evade appearing upon getting missed. So this is <laughs> this is some confusing stuff. So this is, is it a- like the perspective? If you're the player on the top of the ramp, you would see evade because you see stuff relating to you. But uh, if you're on the other, like on another computer firing the attack, you would see miss. Yes, that's got to be it. That's got to be it. That's that solved. sounds like it. Thank yeah, you. Congrats. Solved. You've, you've won that corner. Congrats. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, uphill miss is 25%, and that applies with so random pseudo distribution, which I might touch on again. But it basically means, you know, the longer you've gone without evading, the more chance you've got of evading the next attack, which has some quite interesting implications that I'll maybe come back to. But first, let's go through some of these evasion statistics. Be- before yeah, you move on, on the pseudo bit, that is uh, makes me think of the Gork OD. I missed three yeah. times three hits in a row. row. And they were, they were uphill misses, I believe. Well, I'm pretty certain. Yeah. Because what else would it be? So that, the chance of that happening, it might be, I can't remember if it's three or four. I'm pretty sure he says I've missed three, but I wonder if he missed four. But yeah, mm. the chance of that happening is pretty rough. All you have to know is that pseudo random makes it really hard for you to get multiple bashes in a row. And that if you have hit a lot of times without bashes, you're more likely to get it on the next one. So that's how you're able to like prime a bash in certain cases. Um, but true random is more fun because that's how you, you get like 12 bashes in a row because <laughs> it's just 15% every time. So there's yeah. some game out there where you just bash lock someone 100 to zero. Yeah. Does that mean when you're playing PA, is it important to, yeah, you, can hit you know, creeps. try and hit some t- hit creeps and then, oh, I haven't crit for four hits. Let's fight. I'm probably going to crit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Let's look at some evasion then. First of all, very common one is some items. There's three items that give evasion. I feel like this is quite an easy one. Can you name them? Radiance. Butter, halberd. Radiance gives evasion? No. It gives mischance, which is different. What? How is, it, how is that different? Well, it doesn't give one evasion. How is mischance not the same as evasion? Because well, you, inf- you... it inflicts mischance. That's that's one's the exact give, same one's thing give, as one's evading. To take. Well, one's no, because give, they you you well, you could say it's an evasion aura, kind of, because they're missing all their attacks on everything, not just yeah. You. I mean, okay, so talisman of evasion. Yeah, talisman of evasion, and the two things that it builds into, which is butter and. Halberd, yeah. Um, Talisman of Evasion is fifteen percent. Do you know what Halberd and Butterfly's Evasion is? Are they not the same? No, they're not. Butter's not twenty-five. No, thirty. Butter's thirty-five, isn't it? Is it not? Thirty-five. You you don't got this ready. Butter, butter is thirty-five. Confirmed. My God, that's OP. Butter's OP. Thirty-five percent evasion and. Heaven's Halberd's 20% evasion. So, 
Upgrading to butter turns it from 15% to 35%, which is kind of wild. Um, you feel like you should need two talisman of evasions in there, but you don't. So that's very strong. Um, a lot of these other evasion, evasion abilities are 100%. So, for example, Arc Warden's Magnetic Field grants 100% evasion to all allies inside it. Wind Ranger's Wind Run, obviously 100% evasion as well. Clink's Strength is 100% evasion from ranged attacks. And then there are two other spells in the game. Oh, sorry, three spells in the game that give varying chances of evasion. I don't know if you Hood can... Hoodwink E. Yeah, Hoodwink E, Pan- very good. Panda Brewmaster, Drunken Brawler. Yeah, Drunken Brawler. And then a classic, classic piece of evasion. What, Blur? Yeah, Blur. Um, blur actually uh, pumps you all the way up to 45% evasion at level 4, which is very strong. Um, and it stacks... Uh, multiplicably with other forms of evasion so a phantom assassin with a butterfly I believe would have roughly 65% evasion as opposed to uh, 75 well 80 if it's 45 plus 35 yeah um, yeah you gotta multiply them yeah 0.3 times point, uh, 0.35 times point four, four five. five, and then you add them or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Add one and then another after. That would be too uh be too good. Yeah, if it was if you just additive, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Interestingly, Adam said that mischance was the same as evasion roughly, but mischance it stacks additively. So if you've got something, you know, some radiance on you well, what and else you've also got mischances. Uh there's loads of stuff that mischances, isn't there? I just can't uh, think of them. Trolls, whirling axes. That calls yeah. is blind. Blind yeah, is the uh, blind, blind is the effect. Light. Yeah, blinds the <clears throat> effect. Yeah. Blind in light. Does that do a miss? Is it? What's blind in light? It's oh, that light. push. Yeah. That that big AOE cotton spell. Yeah. Where it boom pushes people. Yeah, that's annoying. Isn't there that's also funny, a? Because I I just considered that evasion, but it is funny that it's not. Because it's kind of like, like AOE evasion. Yeah. I mean, the sa- it's the same, like, end effect. You're, yeah. Yeah. It's the same But I bet thing. it's it probably does say miss. Does it say evade with butterfly? Yes, you evade it. When someone attacks you and you've got butter, you can evade it. But it definitely says miss with radiance. No, yeah. I think it comes back to this. If, if you're the attacker or the defender, if you're the attacker, it'll say miss on your screen. But on the defender's screen... Your enemy's probably. screen will probably say evade. You're right. Interesting. Even so, so if you're Tinker and you laser someone, which is 100% blind, or sorry, if you've lasered them, you're Tinker, you think you see evade when they attack you. Uh, even though they've got miss rate and you have no evasion. Even they've missed. Uh, yeah, I, you, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you don't have any evasion as Tinker, so it's weird... If it yeah, says you, evade. you've not evaded the attack; they've missed the attack. I, yeah. It's your that screenshot you mentioned is what sounds confusing, but sounds like it could be the case. Because yeah, you'd think that you wouldn't see evade; you're not evaded anything. Hmm. Anyway, anyway, this is one. This is one for the viewers to tell us about on Discord, maybe. Yeah. Um, this is but that's, uh, quite the stat corner. This is yeah. an unbelievable stat corner. This is a stat corner. Uh, where I've confused myself and we've learned nothing and we're now more confused <laughs> about Dota. So that's the um... maths is a bit suspect. His, <laughs> his pronunciation of some words is a bit suspect. <laughs> My maths is beyond suspect. My maths is uh, quite appalling. Uh, have you seen the graph, Adam? The pseudo-random distribution graph. So it's a probability distribution function. So yeah. the y-axis isn't the probability. What's the y-axis? I don't know how you'd give a definition to the y-axis but yeah it's the area under the curve gives you the probability that you get attacks in that amount of time so it's saying right. for 15 percent proc chance you gotta add up all the slices before it mm. oh so, i see okay so the probability you get a, a proc in 20 attacks is basically 100 percent. the probability you get an attack in the first one what's that like three percent but then in two attacks it accumulates so to you like, add them yeah, so it the wasn't three and six; it was nine after two attacks because you'd add right. the three and the six together. 
Okay. Makes sense. We'll see what splicing and editing I can do to make myself sound less stupid when I come no, to this, this is the... We learn through the course of the... Of the discussion. episode. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, I'll link in link in the description for this pseudo-random thing. I will pop it in in case people want to have a look. Let's maybe talk about some major action then. Um... Marco, me and you have been watching some major... Adam can tag along as well. Uh... I followed the... Uh, I followed the results and I saw some clips. I'm super stoked that Rich is back hosting. He's the best. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's been at class. Absolute yeah. best. I was sad when he left. And I did not get the pun on Anna Major... Until I saw uh, clips of what the hosts look like and all the like the intro music and cartoons and anime reference, I was like, "Oh, that's what the it's like." Animator, that's weird. And like, oh, oh <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, I yeah, just clocked it. No, no, no. I, I, I realized. I, it's funny that I was laughing that Adam didn't realize because as soon as ah, it, okay. as soon as I saw it for the first time, I was like, "Oh, they're doing an anime major." That's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that at time of recording, uh, Team Secret have just lost two zero to IG, forcing a playoff with Nigma versus IG in the wild card, which is very rough for Nigma because they've they basically had a very high win percentage game ch- you know chalked off the board because of a server crash and now they might not even make it through wildcard which is pretty big for TI because if they make it to the group stage they've got a good chance of making it to TI so this is very rough and, and Secret's probably already locked in for TI right? They are Yes they, they are. are locked yeah. in yeah. Also it's very yeah. grim this is also funny uh, OG needs Nigma to qualify automatically so that they're not in the qualifier in EU um, oh, then we know who I'm cheering for. Yeah, rub my, <laughs> rubbing my hands together. So this is maybe we'll get some more. Uh, maybe we'll get some some tweets. I don't know. So OG yeah. fans need. So sorry, OG anti fans need Nigma to be IG to get into the. No, oh no, they need OG Nigma to lose. Fans need IG yes, to win. We need more EU teams. Uh, so we need Nig- Nigma to lose, and they they go in the open quals and knock OG out. Yes. Yeah, just yeah, more okay. of a chance for someone else to make it out. Yeah, man, the, this wild card, the quality is absolutely phenomenal. Vici, IG, Nigma, Secret, all tier one teams, and then you've got Execration putting up a fight. AS Monaco stealing. I mean, they did pretty well games. for having game two, off IG, game off Secret, two stand-ins. Yeah, two and stand-ins. Uh, you look at you know Secret was going into the last series was zero zero. Zero four zero, like they split four series. Everybody was basically the same. Vici yeah. wins two series two zero, and that automatically made them move on. It's like, damn. Yeah, so many one ones. Yeah, you know, the first day of games there was six one ones and two two zeros. So a lot of even back and forth, like good Dota. A lot of stomps as well. To be fair, and IG beat Nigma two zero on the first day, and yeah. now they're playing again. Yeah, so, they were some good games. So you know that Nigma's going to win 2 0 now. Or just win the tiebreaker. The tiebreaker. Yeah. I mean, IG versus Nigma is like, could be a grand final. Or like, yeah. upper bracket final kind of thing. Yeah. IG having just won the last major and Nigma being. Yeah, the, the four, they've got a weird form. But if you look at Puppy, not Puppy, Kuroki's like, TI finishes so if you don't look at the form of the season but look at say ti finishes over yeah. the last th- three four years nigma and kuroki have like had phenomenal like top four performances every time well, this is the like, non weha <laughs> version of them as well so it's it like a bit different. improved well, it's, different. it's different yeah it's different yeah i yeah. feel like it's a, a bit improved i think miracle mid is is strong yeah yeah miracle is just you know like you'd rather have Miracle mid and ILTW won probably than Miracle won and We Heart mid, mid probably. Yeah. This depends on the I think depends on the heroes. Yeah. But I think Weha has smaller pool, so unless yeah. he's on what Timbersaw and uh Razor. Wind Ranger, like that type Maple. of stuff. Yeah. 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 
I like how Miracle can pop off on. He's either got these hard carries from the mid, like your TA and your morph, which favorably for him, I've seen a lot of meta focus, a lot of bands. Yeah. And he can play your Puck and your Invoker spellcasters and still kind of pop off and carry with those heroes. Um, yeah. Like he's, he's, he's carried a, some Puck games so far where it's like, a, he's like a pub and he's, he's carrying the whole team on his back with a Puck. Yeah. Like, he can play he the has... Topson role and he can play the, uh, just carry mid. I don't know who else yes. carry mids. Yeah, I don't know. Ori, Ori Snorri. Ori Snorri. <laughs> Ori Snorri. Ori Snorri. I was going to say like, RTZ when he played mid. Yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah, it's very strong. Um... I know that when they got to the, wherever, I mean, they got off the flight or, or whatever and he, uh, was spammed like a bunch of Morphling games in a row. Yeah. I also saw a game where he played against GH and he was Void Spirit mid and he got 50 kills. I mean, how does that happen? Five zero kills in a game. <laughs> what? Which is just, it was thir- like a 36 minute game or something. He had 50 kills. What? Uh, as Void what? Spirit. And I was just uh, perplexed. You know, I've probably played 10,000 games, and I think 33 might be my record is like 50. In a wow. 10k pub, where nobody's feeding, <laughs> everyone's like, I don't get it. Yeah, some people are good at Dota. Some people yeah. are pretty good at Dota. Um, Void Spirit OP. It's so fun watching people play well on Void Spirit. I, there was a game where Ori was playing Void Spirit, and they were kind of getting... They were getting stomped for a while in the game i can't remember what series it was i think it was versus secret actually perhaps i can't quite remember no it wasn't secret i I can't remember the game nigma actually it was against nigma and they're getting ran at by this morph that's popping off and this lichen iltw lichen there's a surge darkseer clockwork super aggro and vici is sort of on the back foot and Ori played this insanely good void spirit it's like really fun to watch like the spell casting when I play Void Spirit in these ways, where I go s- sort of Yules, ag- Ags, and stuff like that, I just feel like I fall off. And yet when I watch pros do it, that they don't fall off. Part of it is because of the picks. They've obviously picked around that, so they have a Faceless Void and a Doom and some reasonably high damage supports. So it can get away with more of a spellcasting role for the Void Spirit, and the way that he uses his spells is obviously super high impact to sort of enable the the Faceless Void to do the big chunk of damage and stuff like that, but it's super cool to see. Going to some of these most contested, most picked banned heroes, TA tops the list, 90% contested so far, and then we look down the list at Nyx and Broodmother and AA. Um, you mentioned, Marco, that some of these more snorry mids, like a Morph and like a TA, are doing well. Um, I don't know how many games you've seen with the with TA in, but it seems like a first phaseable hero, new meta emerging. Yeah, I've seen it first phase, and obviously it's got the second highest number of bands after Broodmother. Um, so it's funny. It, I'm interested to see what the group stage meta will be and how similar it will be to the wild card is this just kind of unique to the wild card or will there be mm. some kind of permanent effects it's it seems like it's messages we've not not dissimilar to what we've talked about with recent patch changes that idea that the mid can farm a bit more you got bounty runes and water runes to enable that farm an interesting point bsj said on the panel at one point was about the positioning of the raid of the uh i think it was dire the ancient camp and the hard camp and how it was easier to double stack whereas i guess in the past when we've got different maps maybe you can only stack one of the camps rather than both at the same time and do it with a trap for sure you got traps yeah that can do it but then also if the distance is a bit smaller to say get to those stacks you can move from lane to jungle easier and so it sounds like a lot of little factors all coming in to then go well who's the hero that's best at abusing a afk mid farm kind of game who also can take rosh which we know is absolutely pivotal um yeah. kyle i think has mentioned something about armor but i'm not i'm not sure what that point was and so it seems like I, somehow we've we've come to this stage of ta ticks all these boxes and therefore is first phaseable material and yeah it's, it's kind of snorry 
Yeah. One of those here is it for it farms so fast. Um, it's, yeah. I, I, don't know, I think that this... tan talent with the dragon lance, free dragon lance plus dragon lance, yeah, is just so wild because the whole point of it, like this hero does a lot of damage, uh, but it's balanced by the fact that it has to get kind of close to hit you. Oh wait, no. It can hit you from a million range and then spill uh, side blades a million more range after yeah. that. That's really the crazy thing, is the attack range with this new talent plus 100 attack range. And all the TAs I've seen have gone Dragonlance, which you, you didn't used to see that much. You used to see, de- you know, Treads, Deso, Blink. But now it's, I've seen, I saw Treads, Dragonlance first item and then another game with Deso, Dragonlance into Blink. And it's like you say that the range is is crazy. It's so it's really difficult to play against because you can't you can't kite the TA half as well as you used to be able to in the past by just literally just running away from it. You just can't do it. Another thing um, is the water rune change means that you can't you can't counter the TA in lane half as well as you could in the past. So if you pick TA first phase or second phase, like we've been seeing. You're going to get counterpicked and it's going to be bad for you. But now more than ever with water runes, you can just, you're just fine. You're never going to lose a lane as a TA. It's just not going to happen. Even against a Huskar, you're, you're going to be fine. Even against a yeah, Viper, the you're Magnus going to be effect. fine. You just, just want, you just leave. You, well, first of all, yeah, you just leave. And second of all, with water runes, you don't even have to leave for another, like let a wave or two you know the water runes allow you to get an extra wave before you leave which doesn't sound like much but when you're talking about laning stage and when you're talking about trying to snowball versus a ta i.e not let her afk stuff like that's really important so i think that's allowed the hero to be first phased it's, it's just harder to counter um i find it so interesting yeah, the, the, obviously a lot of small changes then suddenly we've got a tournament where it's I mean, have there ever been a tournament where TA is either first phased or has the highest ban rate? I can't remember any time ever that being the case. And then today it is with all these little changes accumulating. I think the attack range one you mentioned is is particularly interesting because again, it's it, the talent changed since two nine seven two nine, and then it got a buff from plus eighty to a plus hundred in seven point two nine B, and then it's almost like this little. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back that everyone go, oh, actually, talent's not sure. bad. And oh, actually, if we get Dragonlance first item, we've now got plus 240 attack range. And so now all of a sudden you've got a TA that's 400 attack range hero with level four side blades. And that's part of the, the weakness of the hero. 400 attack range is not great. Pseudo range. You've got to be in the mix a bit. It's harder to get your damage output off. You can yeah, try and see blinks. Now it's 640. It's like, okay, this hero is now on another level. And it can do so much more. We don't need to get blink. We just yeah higher than standard range hero range. Yeah, less you can hit them. They can't hit you. I mean, that is that is not the case, or not usually the case. It's like you got to get close before. So it's like, oh, she was like really balanced. You got to get close. She's not that tanky, but she's got refraction to balance it. And now it's like, imagine you're a Medusa with refraction charges, or like imagine that you're like super far ranged. If you're a sniper, not a sniper, but like that level of yeah. you can't get to me, but also mm. I have all of this defensive stuff around me. And then it's not enough that you're getting more range on your attacks. The more range you you have on your attacks also buffs the side blades. Like they have more range too. So it's like you're doubling up. This Nyx Assassin hero, I don't know what I think about it because it's obviously very highly regarded in this major. 87% contest, contested 87% of the time. It's hard for me to gauge what the impact is. It's played pods 4 and I guess it's just being really annoying with Spike Carapace and having a stun. Albeit quite a mediocre stun, but having a stun. And then a vision is it just, person. Vision yeah, game. Is it just pros but- and vision? Yes, it's pros because I feel like that hero is really hard to, to just like pick and make work in a mm. uh, just in a random game. But if you give like 
five coordinated people, I, th- I feel like the win rate of that hero goes way up. Also, with um, the team synergy of, yeah, Vision's massive pros utilize, Nyx is this great ganker that if you've got the coordination to have a plus one that can execute a gank with your Nyx. Yeah. So if you think about there's a lot of AA these days, that's yeah. like a global ganker. There's a lot of kind of morph. You could blow someone up, or a lion's going to blink and blow someone up. Mars. Yeah. There was a lot of potential to blow heroes up these days, and Nick's just. I mean, find a morph while well there. Find a morph while there. Snap fire. Like low, like not shifted strength. I don't know if they pick it a lot with IO, but it's it's you don't even have to because you can be invisible, be going around. A lot of the time, if you're a pro Nix, like you don't even have to use the ult for the damage you just need to have the invisibility to get off the stun and you just sit yeah. at like your tower oh there's one person pushing the tower now there's so many tp angles into the trees it's just like i lead off with a stun someone's been tp'd in and we just get a kill like seemingly out of nowhere mm. it goes from zero heroes to like two or three really fast another one is dark seer is fairly popular as a pick and I've had games on in the background, and I feel like I've seen quite a lot of Dark Sis Nyx combo happening. And yeah. again, that's that's so classic to have Dark with some melee four. What other melee fours are there? I mean, there's there's Tusk and Clock, but or Tiny, but they, they've not really seen much that many picks. Uh, Clock only five, which I guess is three less than Nyx. But again, it's that similar idea of the great lane synergy, and then all these other mid game points. Yeah. yeah, any hero that's got to impale, like you got the chance for the ravage stun, um, which is team fight. Turner uh, on a Q ability is always top tier, and then your spike really does just like destroy some heroes. I don't know. Bat Rider's probably not popular, but anybody that leaves a DOT around, they kind of like destroy themselves yeah like a puck maybe kind of a classic yeah um, yeah it's the, i think that hero really went to top tier uh the first time when you could spike from invis and not break invis is that not because, the case well like no you can that's not, like it used to not be the case then like whatever the last two years or whatever uh, okay when they changed it was the first time people were like oh my god yeah now you're like setting up Instead of, now you've got like a four and a half second stun combo from Invis. Uh, instead of trying to hit a blind stun and then maybe Puck tries to Q away or something, you get him with the E. You get him with the spike. Now it's like guaranteed, really easy combo to pull off. And there's always some hero that uh, doesn't that puts out a lot of damage to farm and doesn't realize that they can get spike care bits like a Kunko or just anything really. Yeah. I was having a thought about Mars, watching some of these pros play Mars. is so impressive. It really is more than a lot of other heroes because the way that the pros play around positioning and, and kiting and being able to kite out of fights and stuff like that, this arena of blood, like five second duration, six or seven second duration the, in level two and three, just the inability of heroes to be able to kite out of that for that mm. long, it's almost as good as like a seven second RP. Like it, so in some games, it, it really is. So I was watching Old Levin play a Mars and he would flank. So say they're playing Dyer in this scenario that I'm thinking of and they're sieging tier one and Old Levin flanks like all the way round and almost f- from behind goes on them gets two heroes in a arena and these are heroes that are positioned right on the edge of being safe and being not safe you know what i mean like if if mars wasn't there and the heroes dived where they would die doing it because they'd overextend and the pros obviously know that that's why they're positioned there and then mars comes in with an arena It changes the whole dimension of the fight. And so I feel like the positioning of a Mars is almost more important than any other hero I can think of. Like, positioning on on Mars as as an offlaner is 
so, so important. And watching these pros like engineer these perfect arena usages mm. is really interesting. Yeah. Somet- sometimes it's super straightforward, right? And they're just arena a hero to gank and it's just like, yeah, a- a- anyone would think to do that. But in mm. these sort of siege situations where you put your Mars, where you put your arena and what, you know, I guess making the spear is a separate issue. But I just thought that was really cool and it was, it was Old Eleven had an insane Mars performance today. Like, unbelievable yeah. Mars. He seems to be a, a god on the God of War. Another way of Mars that I think is really cool, similar to you, this how do you use the arena optionally? And it's pretty basic to go, oh, yeah, this initiation tool. Oh, blink, initiate, arena, there's your fight, let's go. But obviously, in, in these pro games, the recipe's not that simple. What I feel like I've seen a, a good handful of times with Mars and the teams is someone will basically bait a a fight to happen such that they know chaos is going to ensue and people's positioning and awareness is going to break down because all of a sudden there's 10, 15 other factors to be thinking about because a fight just Mm. happened and there's clutter going on. And so a hero kind of initiates or like baits a fight or kind of draws enemy heroes onto them by like, it looks like they're out of position or they've moved forward aggressively and then they respond like, you're out of position or you're overly aggressive. Now we respond and then it kind of draws them in a bit. And then a, a Mars kind of snaps and goes, your heroes are now kind of like sufficiently close together for me to get this great, effectively counter initiation. And what we need is just hold you in place and to have you not strategically positioned far away from each other where the, the ult is not effective, but you've come drawn in, if you like. I mean, it happens often with say like an RP counter initiation like you draw in a fight and then all of a sudden you've lost your positioning because of the fight happening and chaos and then you get form an rp it's a similar idea but again with the bars it's it's not about this blink initiation or even a spear combo it's literally just we want to get you in an area you can't leave and we we draw you it's like a little it's just a trap draw you into x area from some baity play boom blink there's a mars arena around you shit you can't get out shit you're too close together you can't even like spread out because you're blocked off by a wall so spells are hitting multiple heroes etc i think yeah it's really cool to watch some pros are remarkably patient with big spells Mm. i've seen on i've seen it on faceless void a lot which is one of the most picked carry in fact the most contested carry um 71 percent contest rate and I was watching, I think, I think it was Po Pio Yo Yo, whatever his name is, playing a, a void. And I guarantee any player that isn't like a god Dota pro would have pressed Chrono at ten opportunities earlier than Pio Yo Yo did in a team fight. And um, in fact, there, there was one fight where he died having not cast the spell the whole fight, and it was still correct because the. It, you know, there's just no need. Like, what they're waiting for something very specific. Uh, in this case, I think it was an opportunity to catch Puck. It didn't arise, and so they're skirmishing, they're skirmishing, they're skirmishing. He's getting really low, like, really low. It's, it's very tense. And he could chrono and kill, like, a, I think, a Mars or, or, like, a Tiny or someone, or a Doom, maybe. But it's not worth it for the spell, and so he's just holding it, holding it, holding it, and eventually... There's like two deaths on either side, and he just time walks out, and it's like so interesting. And then he's got Chrono and uses it in like a skirmish thirty seconds later, and it's great. It's just it's really impressive watching some of these pros like not use spells when your whole body is just like your mind is just screaming like I've got Chrono, I've got Chrono, I've got Chrono. Like use it on a hero, use it on a hero, get a kill. So so it's sort of cool to see, especially because. I think in the since certainly since I've started playing Dota, which is the last four years or whatever, I've seen people be more trigger happy with a lot of spells. RP one hero just to get a kill, black hole one hero just to get a kill. That didn't used to happen as much, but now it happens all the time. And yet, in these other situations in the mid game and in fights, it seems to be the other way around. And I guess it just shows that people are getting better at the game in all regards. Particularly the these mid game fights that that happen in pro games. I mean, it's why it's so enjoyable to, to spectate. But these mid-game fights, they don't last 10 seconds or the, there was rarely kind of a clear-cut winner. Yeah, the, These fights can happen over a relatively long amount of time because everyone's so good, it's so hard to find that perfect opening. In contrast to pubs where it's like, 
most fights are pretty one-sided or should be yeah. one-sided. And they start some, with someone feeding. Basically. Yeah, like really just bad stuff going on. Where in the pro in these pro games, like they both know they want to fight or they both feel like they want to, but they're both kind of trying to eke that strategic advantage or where can they make their spells the most effective? And it kind of takes like a minute for all of this to play out, which is a relatively long amount of time. And so, like you say, yeah. with the chrono, oh, it feels like there's so many opportunities to use it, but they're so good positioning, spell usage, item usage, timing, so good that it's like they have to find the precisely perfect moment to go or do something or cast something. Yeah. That then, yeah, you see them holding, holding, and it's like feels so unnatural because that would just never happen. Yeah. Situations like this would just never, ever, ever, ever happen in a pub. Hmm. Let's maybe just for the last five minutes, anything, any other trends we want to shout out? I've been interested to see this Ursa Diffusal, which seems like it could be fun to try it in some pubs uh, to mixed mixed results at the major, but I don't know if there's anything that anyone else wants to shout out. What Diffusal? Uh, Ursa. Ursa Diffusal. It sounds oh. fun. Is I know it was picked up in a game, maybe multiple games where there was a morph on the enemy team, but has it been being picked up when there even is no morph, and just as a kind of tempo, diffusal, BKB, you don't need to farm, you just fight. I saw it in a game versus Wraith King as well, which makes sense. True. Um, I feel like you want to do it against Puck or Void Spirit or... Yeah. AM. Heroes that you want to get rid of their mana. That limits yeah. their mobility. Oh, I think I it's, like a, it's like a tempo thing, isn't it? Be yeah, it's to be more tempo, obviously. But then... Buff damage as well. Yeah, we, it, yeah, Diffuser got buff. BSJ made a good point of, say you're playing the Ursa, your hero, I mean, he actually doesn't think it's good and think it's, it's weak, and it, it there's only specific games where it'll work when you're kind of crushing and you hit the rush timings, but he very much emphasised right. the hero is all about the rush timings, and if because you can get a shard at, say, 25 minutes, if you get 15-minute rush, because you're a natural rush killer, and then if you can get 25-minute rush and get a 1.4k item... Yeah. which on Ursa is really good that Earth shot gives you Enrage it's such a high value shard being able to get that gives you the license to not be a farm heavy battle fury kind of build and instead of farm heavy battle fury for 25 minutes you can be a fighter from 15 once you've got defusal all the way up to 25 you get the shard and now you've got just kind of pure fight items rather than any wastage on a battle fury so he, he was like, I don't think it's a good hero. Weak laner. It has to get a fast rush, and it has to get a second rush. Um, That's pretty be... funny, because it's like, imagine what happens when you don't get the second rush. Like, the other team gets it, and you're mm. stuck on this build that's not uh, Battle Fury. You're like, oof. Yeah. Any other hero things you want to shout out? I think it's I mean... cool to see AA still up there, so there was those little nerfs and but the hero is still the highest pick as we speak. 11 picks, 73% win rates, with very strong win rate with the Mars as well. Um, yeah. Is that just Ice Blast, basically? It's also the Ice Vortex, so people have been saying... So if you think about the, the Vanguard meta and Axe, Centaur, very tanky heroes, mm. physically tanky, the solution to that is you either reduce people's armor or you use magic damage as opposed to physical damage. So TA obviously minus armor, but magic damage, if you think about AA, Ice Vortex is a big magic damage, magic damage buff. You've then got other heroes like, even if you just ring, go down the list of a Mars, Morph, Lion, Nyx, Darkseer, Willow, Snap, all magic damage heavy. So AA is synergizing with so many popular picks, plus mm. the, the ultimate global, I think it's percentage HP removal. So that's kind of good against tanky people. So. It means, yeah, AA's got this guaranteed synergy, and if you've got a setup for that ultimate to land, the numbers are pretty strong, um, just raw numbers on, on the ult. So it's still clearly heavily favoured and heavily successful, at least in the wild card. AA yeah. top played with Ancient Apparition. Or, sorry, Mars AA combos 4-0. Yeah, really? I went. Oh. I played against that in my pub as Ursa, and it was not nice. The AA in the lane. It just works so well. You you drop yeah. down the ult. Your ice vortex basically covers up the the uh, 
the arena, extra magic damage, makes hitting your ult easy. Yeah. Put down your, what's the Q? Cold feet? Yeah. Mm. Put down your cold feet while they're speared to a wall. Yeah. That's a that's a nice little combo. Easy way to be 4-0 together. Also interesting is Mars is 6-0 and on Dire. For whatever reason, probably sample size. He's yeah, three and two. So. He's three and two on radiant, six and zero oh on dire, which means he's nine and two. So he's just a good hero. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was interesting what Marco was saying about TA and the dire stuff because TA has been in, in. He's been picked on dire in six games and picked by radiant in one game. So maybe people like it in dire, but to be honest, it's pro- again, it's probably sample size. Um, ah. be- yeah, that is small sample. I do think there could be something to that. Yeah. Well, that's what they sort of say, don't they? People, a lot of the these analysts have said Dyer is more inclined to play defensive, and Radiant's more inclined to play aggressive. So heavy stack lineups prefer Dyer, mm. and they just make loads of stacks and farm them. And then Radiant lineups prefer to play aggressively because uh, of the yeah. way the the farm is distributed and stuff. I think Kyle also said the die. I think he said the Dyer Radiant. Sorry, the Dyer Triangle, where the Ancients are. It was easier to defend or easier to ward or kind of defensively well, ward? Any time a de- Radiant team falls behind, the Dyer just sits on that ancient triangle and just waits for them to come because they mm. have to. If they want to try and contest Roche, it's like, we have the high ground, just sit here. Mm. Yeah, it yeah, is hard to hold that, um, hold that spot. Also, Faceless Void is 0-4 against Morphling. Or sorry, Morphling is 0-4 against Faceless Void. Interesting. Which makes I know, sense. Uh, I guess you just chrono drop everything on the morph. If he doesn't get his uh doesn't get his shift off, that's an easy kill. IG have been picking I think it was I oh, I feel like the Chinese teams have been picking Void quite a bit and have success. Big team fight all, etc. Yeah. I, I didn't realise um I asked final thing that Nigma's playing now against yeah. IG, IG. The, so this gives gives it away as to when we're recording. I, it's actually mad because IG have played four, or is it only three series? Have they played? Oh, maybe they've only played three series. I thought they played four series today. IG. I oh, know they have played three, but now they're doing a tiebreaker. Is it best of one? Yeah, man, best of one for a place in the group stage. But yeah, I mean Nigma have played one series today. IG have played three. Best of three series. So that's a big difference. Mm. Yeah, so rough for, for Nigma if they lose this after what's happened. We talked about that earlier. Um, in terms of the picks and stuff, I think Brood is still going to be banned more than it's picked just because it's Brood. Mm. And then obviously EG are coming in tomorrow. So Storm Spirit, that's going to be flying up once Abed gets his hands <laughs> on some, some oh, Storm yeah. action. Um, Do you know uh, who is... I don't know if you want to say the worst. Who has the worst win rate in the most amount of games? Um, don't know. What position? Uh, oh, is it tiny? I, mean, I guess a f- yeah, it's tiny. I guess four. I think I saw that. Yeah, he's at zero and five. Oof. Interesting watching um these games. Fluffy hats have been very common, and these supports have been kind of tanking themselves up and i've seen quite a lot of games where supports will get their hp to a, a level that they can't be burst or the nyx tries to burst them with someone and they don't die because they've got multiple f- fluffy hats um and they've got six items and the prioritizing health points so think yeah, about if you fluffy it, hat plus uh raindrop yeah raindrops because okay. if tiny doesn't blow someone it's it's not a hero it's use, it's useless outside the blow yeah. does so yeah, yeah. And if he combos you, like if you're a CM and he combos you and you live, you just root just... him an ult, <laughs> then you you turn the yeah. fight. Yeah. If you're a professional player that's paid a lot of money to play Dota 2, then you should be aware of exactly what you know level and item you need to not die to certain combos and stuff. I know it's hard, but like. They probably know, right? They probably know that they if they have a fluffy hat or two fluffy hats and a raindrop, then they won't die to a level whatever seven tiny combo or something. Yeah. Maybe it's just maybe it's just all intuition, but they probably know stuff like that. 
Um, yeah, huge amount of intuition, but I do, f- I don't know if it's because I've not watched pro games in a while, but I feel like I have. I do feel like I'm noticing a lot more HP on supports these days. Yeah. From item choice. Yeah. Um, finally then, just to close out, some predictions. Who's taking this one home? Who's taking the animator home? Although it actually <laughs> won't be over when we next record. But anyway, most of it will be over, so we need to do the uh, predictions now, I guess. Secret smiley face. <laughs> no, they're already eliminated. Good call. Nice. Uh, not, not OG. I do feel like <laughs> EG has a good chance, but they haven't played yet, so it's hard. I think the more interesting question is, do you think one of the two wild card teams, whoever it is, will win because they're more practiced? I think they'll make it to the upper bracket. They got, uh, they got the I think flow going. I have Vici coming third, which I think is fair. I mean, LGD last major went all the way from wild card to third. Yeah. So I, I think it's unlikely they'll win. As weird as it is. I actually think a team like Asta or Alliance that just start in upper bracket playoff, they actually have a great chance because all they have to do is is spike one little run. Whereas a team like Vici, mm. they've got to spike a run in the group in the wild card, then do it again in the group stage, then do it again in the playoffs. Yeah. It's just hard. It's just really difficult. It's funny. I know they're like Yeah, it's just hard. You like you look at the Liquipedia, it's got the wild card, round and robin. And then it goes to the group stage round robin, and like those teams aren't even on this list. So I was wasn't even considering them. And it's like, oh yeah, those guys that just yeah. get to go like all the way to the end. Yeah. So Alliance and, and like Quincy Crew and Aster. Because yeah. in the oh, groups, man. yeah, there's eight. It's really hard for one of those six teams to not win because it's like so much of an advantage. It's a it's a huge advantage. Only two group stage teams go to upper bracket. Yeah, that's so that is that is tough because the groups have got quality teams in them. So EG have to yeah. perform. Consi- well, but then it's like, yeah, if you're going to win the tournament, you got to perform consistently. Yeah. But like you say, it's such a big difference if you're already in the the playoff bracket. But as Chris said, you know, you get more games in the groups, so tactical loss to Quincy. Yeah, rather for being the groups. Yeah, I think it's more likely that a group stage team makes a run than a wild card team. For sure. It's just a while yeah, well, to, to um to play before getting to the end. I think uh I still like E. G though. Uh T one uh the playoff seeds probably Alliance and T one. Really you like T one? I'm the I'm SEA hater. Yeah, huh? I'm a I'm a like SEA US East here. I pr- I think TA and VP are just gonna lose their first game, and then be lower bracket. You can't. And then like Aster has. I mean, Lanham as a five. That's that's probably a good team. I have not seen them play, but can't, yeah, can't go against a team with him. You can't. I mean, the first place DPC China. They're gonna be good at the game, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so. It, it's so grim to think that, you know, we just said that uh, it's more likely a group stage team makes a run. That's because one of the, you, you have to come top two in the group stage to get up a bracket. So if you've done that, you're going to be in a strong yeah. position. Think about these upper bracket teams. They've got to win, how many maps have they got to win to win the entire tournament? Two, four, six. They've got to win nine games. That's all they've got to do. Think about how many games Vici have to win. <laughs> to win this tournament, it's, it's like insane. thirty games. It's like yeah, it's like four times more at least. It's kind of bonkers. Like, DPC is so more. important. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see Beast Coast and No Ping play. Um, S South American lads. Uh, I have PSG LGD winning the whole thing. In fact, I have my predictions on the Discord, which I didn't spend too much time on, but uh, my predictions there. Uh, what about uh, we haven't even said. Team Liquid with some mail. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. That'd be like, cool if they go against EG. What if they win and then they kick Boxy? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I had no idea when he's coming back, but they're doing well with Smell. Don't see why not if they're doing well. The, the thing 
that maybe is rough. What if they just kick Quaifer and get Boxy back as a three? Is Quaifer's <laughs> is Quaif- be <laughs> is Quaif- is three better than Boxy's well, three? Well, he, he used to be a three. That's when he started playing was as a three. Oh, okay. That's a bit more reasonable. It'd be rough for Boxy if, like... Your mid's just better than you at three, so that you get kicked from him <laughs> after he's like, stood in his three. He's Admiral Bulldog Light, Nature's Prophet, and Lundrin. Yeah. Bulldog's weird, though, because I don't understand that, because Lundrin's not a three, so I guess he just uh, plays it three. Oh, yeah. it was a three? Okay. They, when he was playing it, it was three. When he was playing, yeah. he was carry from the off lane. So it was like, even before carry from the mid... Uh, he was carried from the offlane. You go to you go to Quifa's Liquipedia page. His signature heroes are Lone Druid, Nature's Prophet, and Storm. Mm. I'd agree with that probably. He likes a brood as well. I feel. Yeah, he used to do it in brood. the mid. Yeah. Well. Well, there you go. Lots to look out for for next week's episode, where we'll be into the playoffs. Um, you mentioned Liquid playing EG. That will happen because they're both in the group stage round robin, so that'll be quite fun to see. Oh, yeah. Is a round robin um, best of twos? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's all best yeah. of twos, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, watch this space. We'll be back again next week. More trends to discuss, more Dota to discuss. And until then, have a final whistle.